the test bed for 5G, you know, and some people might have heard about this, but they said that one of the side effects from 5G was that it caused flu-like symptoms in people. And before that, I remember reading last year where they put 5G um, radios in some um, fire departments, and they complained that their firemen were getting sick and they took them down. Research this yourself. That's right here in America. They refused to, so they, they took them down because it was making the firemen sick. Things that make you wonder. Be that as it may, where we are today is we have to really consider if being totally dependent on someone else to provide food, clothing, and shelter for you and your family is a smart move as a society. I know we've been conditioned, we've been all trained to think that that's the way to live. But perhaps what we really need to do is challenge that concept and really think about it. Because society as we know it now is only a couple of hundred years old. The history of mankind on planet Earth is way longer. So maybe the mistake we're making is thinking that we're all that and we're all so much smarter and that things are much better with this advanced technology of our time. I'm suggesting that we strongly challenge that. We may be painting ourselves into a corner that we cannot escape from. And largely that seems to be the case now because people are very scared about where their next meal is coming from or even bigger, you know, they worried about their jobs. But I will share this with you. I remember probably, it's probably been 12, 15 years ago now that I was at a conference and we were all asked to stand up if we had a job. Most of us are very happy and proud to do that. The presenter then lamb blasted us all by saying, that's the problem. You're so happy to have a job, but he says job stands for journey of the broke jump out of bed on the journey of the broke to be just over broke. And that's where we, most of us are as a society and as a culture. And people say, yes, but you have to. Well, part of the miseducation is what makes capitalism work is that you convince the population that they have to depend on someone else to provide everything for them and you get away from doing it for yourself. So to the degree that you can with whatever space you have, what you can do to help yourself is to do everything possible to secure your own food supply for yourself and your family. And sometimes you can do this on a community level and that's what you have to do. So um, get those seeds, get you some good organic matter. If you do raised beds, small greenhouses, whatever kind of space you have, get to growing food, but don't forget the security part of it because as much as you would like to give it away and share it, you know what? When you're hungry, all of that goes away fast. Okay? So anybody have any particular questions you want to ask? And we can go from there. Let me what tech what techniques uh, what techniques do you use to help um, uh, add nutrients to your uh, to your soil? Okay. Okay. Here's on, on my, on our farm, what we do. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, a liquid fertilizer made by a company by the name of Neptune's Harvest. I've used Neptune's Harvest for years. It's an OMRI Organic Material Review Institute approved. And it's liquid. It's very cost effective. You can mix it with water and really, Everything you can want to grow to eat will utilize it well. From tomatoes to melons to okra to onions, they all do well with that. I also use, uh, I have goats on my farm, so I use their composted manure as well. And then I'll cover my beds with um, straw or hay that's left over and basically let it decompose and then turn it and start again. But I also cover crop and rotate, you know, things. I give it a, a season to rest and then I'll plant there and then I'll run the animals through it, and then I'll plant there again, and I just do that over and over again. So to answer your question, what you can do where you are, I highly recommend Neptune's Harvest. It's a very economical solution that works well. 
Yep, that's perfect. Duran put the link on there. Definitely check it out. Um, you won't be wasting your money. It's good. Um, what about uh, somebody put on here? Um, uh, do you grow? Do you grow the three sisters? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We grow them every year because we we like. To eat. Basically, I, I grow ninety five percent of what I eat. I grow myself. So yes, we definitely will have all three of them growing here. Mm -hmm. And another thing is, when you pick the cultivars to grow, again, I, I recommend at Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, but you know, Baker's is also very good. There's a lot of seed companies that you can get good seeds from. That's not a problem. But try to select for what will do well in the southeastern region. And some of these varieties that have been around and the heirlooms have, are tried and true. They've been around for hundreds or so years and they're open pollinated. You can save the seeds. So think about saving your seeds for next year. So you don't want to be in the same situation over and over again. You know, so if you've got, if you have to do this in a, in a barrel, cut that barrel in half, set it up, fill it with some good organic soil and grow you something there. You can grow some food that will help your family out and also grow some good herbs. One very important herb right now is thyme, T-H-Y-M-E. Thyme is very important in keeping you healthy and thyme also is uh, an herb that's recommended to fight off this uh, coronavirus stuff that's, uh, that's all around us now. We've got another question down here. Um, Baba Zibu says, uh, what is good seed storage, temperature air sealed? And I'm gonna throw in another one. Um, can you talk about the soil food web? Because I, I think for a foundation for everybody, like mm -hmm. everybody might not understand when you say mycelia, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or microbacteria, they might not understand what those things are. So um, okay. what about the seed storage? And um, then talk a little bit about the soil food web. Yeah, seeds, most, most of the vegetables that we're going to grow need to be kept in a cool storage. Some can be refrigerated and they're kept very well. I put them in uh, empty glass jars and, you know, put the lid on them and kept them for a couple of seasons in the fridge. Um, others I've keep just in a cool room in the house and, and, and they're good from year to year. Um, some actually do better um, when they're chilled because it helps them to germinate. You, you got to, you know, know. But if you're going to grow your usual stuff, your tomatoes, squash, okra, corn, lettuce, radishes, melons, and stuff like that, they'll do fine at, you know, in a temperature that you're comfortable in, but you don't want them to get like 90 degrees and, and stay there for a long time. So um, if you're at 60, 65 degrees is good. You want to keep them cool and keep them in a darker place if you can, and they'll do fine. But, you know, yeah. And I saw somebody said about the free seeds, definitely. And oregano is a good antifungal herb, but you want to get the Mediterranean, oregano, Mediterranean, sometimes called Greek. Greek is part of that part of the world because that has the higher um, antibiotic um, factor. Another good herb is cilantro. Cilantro has the same um, antibiotic effect as the chemical medicine erythromycin. So that's also a very good one to have. And it grows in the cool season, so you'd want to start there pretty quick. And of course, when the cilantro goes to seed, it forms coriander. Mm. So you, you've got that part too. It's a two part plant. But um, I like that. Well, let's see. After how many years do you throw away seeds? Uh, somebody's asking so, Holly, you know, I, I don't keep seeds usually more than three seasons, but I can tell you uh, um, some of them are, are viable six, seven, even 10, 15 years. And there's some seeds that have been around. On, and stuff are good for even a thousand years and they're still viable. Now we're not going to live that long ourselves, so we don't have to stretch it that far. I would say save your own seeds from season to season, keep enough to keep ahead, but there's no point in having 10 year old seeds around when you can have fresher ones, you know? So two or three years is plenty good. If you're going to do survival type gardening, you're going to grow stuff every year, save it for a year or two max and then keep the fresh ones because what you should be doing through this process is selecting for the stronger ones that grow well in your micro environment. So if you've got that beautiful looking tomato that just looks, that's the one you want to save and not eat. You want the seeds from that one. So you can genetically have the stronger ones to continue that seed line on. And that way you will have a better return on your time and labor. 
and a better yield from those seeds. So you'll be selecting the best ones season after season mm -hmm. in your own space. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about um, uh, organic matter and adding organic matter to your uh, to your grow area to uh, exactly. build up your soil tilth and, and etc. You want you want to do that. So that's you know the tilth part. The T I L T H is very important. You want your soil to be what's called friable, which means you, you should be able to stick your hand in your soil like up to your at least the depth of your wrist and crumble it up and it should fall right back down. That's if it has a good tilth. So a lot of people, you can broad fork it and turn it. You can use a tiller, whatever method you have, you know, shovel, pickaxe, whatever. You want to turn it, but you want to incorporate as much organic matter, leaf, you know, dried decomposed leaves, your vegetable peels, earthworm castings, um, animal manure. If there's somebody that you, you can get some horse manure, chicken manure, or if you have to buy it, buy it. You don't need a whole lot. Mix it in there and let it age up. Start saving your scraps from all of your peelings and stuff. Make your own compost, mix it all in. Mm -hmm. Just dig you a space. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna do this year is I, I, I bought a bunch of these plastic um, barrels. Uh, they were like food grade stuff had been kept in them and I'm cutting them in half lengthwise and I'm just filling them with a good organic potting soil. And, and, and I'm of course, I'm putting my own organic nutrients and stuff to it. And in those, I'm gonna grow some specific things like, you know, like say I want parsley or I want purple carrots. Then when I go to, to harvest them, you just pull them up. And it's much easier to water that. You can get those barrels, drill you some holes in the bottom, fill it with your soil. You can make that rather relatively easily. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but if you said you had, what if you had five of those and you grew five different things that you would eat regularly, that's a big step towards, you know, not getting those missed meal cramps when the, there's no food at the store. Um, go ahead and uh, some, there's a couple questions in, in the chat um, mm -hmm. and, and most of them are related to uh, okay. growing in smaller okay. areas. So uh, Ariel's asking about uh, tips for uh, growing herbs. Okay, uh, cool. And so, uh, yeah, you give her a little bit I'm of saying, yeah, I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading them now. Okay, so let's, let's see. Nick says he lives in an apartment. He has a small space. Use your balcony. I've got a sister who lives in a different city. And she does her balcony, you know, five, you can go to Lowe's, just any place. They have those five gallon buckets, they're about three bucks. Drill you some holes in the side, put you some big rock in the bottom, fill it with the good organic soil. You can use Pro Mix, mm. go to, you know, some place like that. And um, I'm telling you, if you do that, you'll, the stuff will grow. Um, of course, your exposure is important. Hopefully you're gonna get enough natural sunlight um, to do that there. And, um, and just grow them there. Herbs will grow very well. Their roots don't have to go down, but most of the time, five or six inches, of course, depending if it's a root or if it's different, but five or six inches is plenty you know, for them to grow. Um, yeah, so the five gallon buckets are a good way to start. You can grow quite a bit. You can grow tomatoes, you can grow some cucumbers, you can grow some lettuce, you can grow some basil, some oregano, some thyme. Um, you can grow one squash plant or something, but you're not gonna grow like 10 or 20, but you want five more buckets, then you put five more buckets up and put an individual squash plant in each one. That way they can grow out. Um, you could put a trellis on your balcony and grow the cucumbers up it. You could try to modify the three sisters, but corn should be planted in rows that are four rows dense. And it takes quite a bit of space. So it's not the best container plant. It just truly isn't. Um, it, it won't pollinate, you won't get the yield. Okay, what else is somebody saying? KT, native plants, one of the best ways you've seen. Aha, huh. native plant-based agriculture, intersection. Okay, wow, that's a complicated question, but um, native plant-based agriculture intersecting with community gardens. Uh, well, you know what? Um, I would say I would defer that question to the indigenous peoples that, that I know because that's what they do. So there's a right down in that area, this guy by the name of Fix Kane. I and he does the indigenous that. seed savers. I would say hit up Fix and ask him or, and his wife. Um, there will be your source for good indigenous seeds. Um, somebody asked me, do I grow mushrooms? I don't personally, but I have a friend who has a mushroom farm 15 minutes away. So, is you know, Mark? all I have to do is, and Mark. Yeah, Mark Jones. Yeah. yeah. Sharondale Farms. Right, right, right. I talked to him today, and if I need mushrooms, I just, you know, call him up and go get them. So, there you go. Good stuff. Oh, yes. I got some of that 
I don't have the spot for that, but that's a great mushroom. Yeah, he's like 15 minutes from me, so yeah, we're yeah. with him. You know, I just talked to him today. I've got some spawn for some stuff. Matter of fact, um, he he cut some um, Alanthus trees from my farm to drill to put the spawn in to grow some of his mushrooms on. Yeah. So I got some of that. So okay. so that's a so that's a, a, a to to speak to that native plant piece. Yes. You know, there's a lot of native plants that are edible. You know, that's right. and, you know, if, as we do, as you connect with Fix and mm -hmm. uh, Beth Roach and find more information, like that's we'll right. try to get that information out on right. uh, through, through the through the uh, circulation. Uh, stuff like pawpaws, people are oh my god, they're delicious all over top of. You know, they that's are delicious. Business. That's a, that's a native plant. So, yes. you know, there's, there's some ways that we could probably incorporate those into some of the green spaces and gardens. I know um, uh, grow, some of the local nurseries sell them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. They grow up and down the riverbanks. They like the understory and shade. And it's a delicious, it's the, it's the most tropical tasting native fruit in this country. So definitely look up pawpaws. Now, one other, one herb that I just found out about recently is something called purple dead nettle. And um, I have it growing here, um, but I, I was, someone mentioned it to me, so I went to researcher because I'm a researcher first. And um, purple dead nettle has some really good properties to it. I'm pretty sure it's growing around you, probably right out there in parks. But y'all look up purple dead nettle, purple dead nettle. Read up on it because it's got some real good properties to help keep you healthy. And I'm pretty sure you can find it wherever you are for free. That's always a good thing. Uh-huh. Yeah, definitely share Mark Jones stuff. He's a good guy, good grower. Oh, somebody says their backyard's covered in it. It's read up on it. I've got it in my yard too. You know, and I up until now I have been cutting it, but not anymore. Okay, edible landscape in Nelson. Yes, very good place to go there too. I've known him for about 30 years. Um, good place to go. Good place. Hey, uh, talk a little bit about cover cropping. Okay. So cover cropping for you guys, um, oh man, clovers work good. What you want to do is you want legumes that put nitrogen into the soil and you want to keep that covered so it should never be bare. First of all, it should never be bare. Something green should always be growing there. Vetchers are good, clovers are good. Uh, no, I hope we didn't lose them. Uh, no, I don't know. We might have lost the Zebo. I'm gonna try to get him back. Um, let me see. I'm about to text him now. Um, but yeah, check this out. The uh, cover cropping. Uh, there's different types of uh, cover crops that you could put down. Uh, Southern state sells stuff like ryegrass. Um, we also, uh, seen people planting, uh, cow peas, um, or pigeon peas. Um, also see people planting like turnip greens, um, uh, radishes. There's like different types of radishes people put down as a couple crop. Uh, we all know the story about George Washington Carver and the peanuts, right? So George Washington Carver was using peanuts um as cover crops right because uh the cover crops are uh well peanuts are nitrogen fixers right so what it means is that these plants when they grow their leaves their, their leaves absorb nitrogen from out of the air and store it in the roots uh, of the plant so when um you know you put these nitrogen you plant these nitrogen fixers as a cover crop once you uh, are ready to grow in your garden space, just cutting it down. Hold up, are you back, Brother Zebo? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what happened. It flashed off, but it looks like it's back now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> I was just telling them about peanuts and uh, oh, as a cover crop. Peanuts, peanuts are a legume. That's why they would work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the first things I grew as a child was, uh, was peanuts. When I lived in an apartment, it was crazy. I like to eat them, so I figured I would try some. And um, I guess I had a 
you know, about an eight or 10 inch thing. And I did it for an experiment and, you know, I got three peanuts and I thought I was crazy. I thought, oh man, how nice is that? But, um, you know, you can grow them for, you get a double crop that way you can eat them and turn them back in and put the nitrogen back in there. That's good. Um, Clovers work really good. They're easy. And they're, I mean, the seeds are tiny. You get a, a, a big bang for your buck using clover. I bought some ryegrass. I try. I, I put on a I put on a, a, a row of ryegrass in, in between one of the rows, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it it established pretty pretty thick. Man, that stuff is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's, it's it, nothing was good, nothing's gonna grow <laughs> I, I, unless I till that up. Rye does rye does really well. And another thing about rye is that rye, one of the things that makes it so good when you plant it as a as a cover crop is that. The roots exude a chemical that actually inhibits the growth of other plants around it. So you get a really pure stand. So that's why farmers like it a lot. You know, and I'm, I'm talking about annual type rise, just perennial type rise as well. The perennials, of course, are going to be a harder, you're, you, you, they're not going away. Yeah, right, But they right. both work well. They both yeah. work well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like red clover, ladino clover. And I also like buckwheat. One of my favorites It's very quick to establish. You know, and it's great for um, attracting the beneficial insects. So I always plant a border of buckwheat around our garden areas mm -hmm. because I want them to bring the pollinators. It only yeah. takes 28 days from seed to flower, very quick, and wow. you just incorporate it back into the soil. So, and if you really want, you can save the groats and grind your own flour and make your own pancakes and biscuits if you really want to get into it. But yeah, mm -hmm. buckwheat is good stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I got some um, bambara nuts. Uh, from uh, West African bambara nuts, and I, I'm I'm going to be trying those. I'm really excited about them because yeah. they're nitrogen fixers too, and they're supposed to be drought tolerant, which is that's the biggest part of it. That I'm kind of like, all right, if we can get some of these, what 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 would that? And then they're supposed to be, supposed to be super nutritious too. Yeah, and moringa. I've got moringa seeds, but I'm going to wait for it to get warmer because I'm gonna, I like to go direct to the ground, mm. you know. But um, I think I'm going to be building some more. Uh, enclosures for um, food security here so okay. I might end up building a something that uh, I can keep it in year-round if I build it tall enough go they back to, like crazy go back to talk about the soil food web because we skipped over that um, okay talk about what the uh, what that is so that people can understand like the, the 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 dynamics of what's happening beneath the soil sure sure so you know everything starts with the soil so the most important ingredient is to get the soil right that means you're going to incorporate a as much organic matter into the soil as you can you're only going to use organic nutrients the balance when we're talking about the web is is not what you can see above the soil it's what's happening underneath the soil that's where the magic really occurs so that that whole web is is getting that oh man it's like a whole universe of its own Mm -hmm. And the best way that I can explain this is that that universe underneath the soil is full of microbes and bacteriums and nutrients of all different kinds, but the plants can't extract the optimal amount of nutrition from that soil without those bacteriums being in balance. So mm -hmm. when that balance is right, when that whole web is right, and when it's balanced, that's when your garden is at its best. Mm -hmm. And, and really, Really, the least that you disturb it, once you get it balanced, the better balance it remains. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to get in a really spanking great garden, you know, like say in 2020, right. and then in 2022, it'll even be more incredible right. because it's had a chance to, to stabilize and get that, that web just right. And mm -hmm. man, I'm telling you, uh, I've started from raw land before and worked my tail off, you know, for a couple of years until I got the balance right. And I was, you know, adding organic matter and animal manures and liquid nutrients to it to get it right. But by that third or fourth season, it could do it. All I'd have to do would really is spit a seed out and it would grow. You know, there was a book I read. I get excited about this one. It was called The No-To Revolution. It was a Japanese, um, Lord, what is his name? <sighs> is it so Do years. Nothing Farming? Say that again? Is it do nothing farming? Um, it's 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 in that John. You know, it's I think it was called. Um, I, I want to call him Professor. Oh man, I wish my wife remember she, Fuji. 
no straw revolution or one straw revolution oh, I have to look oh up the name. yeah 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 i'll yeah, send yeah. it to you but i read this book it's probably been 40 years that's one straw long revolution long. is the book it's good that's mm -hmm. a serious eye opener and modern times yeah somebody's citing something there now um dr elaine ingham just read her stuff it's it's really good and I, I'm thinking about taking the course that she had too. It's like about five thousand dollars to take that course. Wow. Maybe she'll wave. Maybe she'll wave it as a social justice move. Yeah. Right. You know? right, right. Wow. But um, it, it would be a very, very good thing to do. I mean, I got the concepts down, and I can, I can grow everything I need. So, but it's always good to learn, and I'm, I'm never going to stop learning. I, every day, I want to learn something new. You know. So, uh, so uh, Kenyatta's asking about quick growing crops. I think it's back to the food security combo. Um, okay. What would you advise, like, as stuff that's quick to grow? Okay, uh, okay. First things, Kenyatta, interestingly enough, most of us eat squash. Most of the squash, many squashes will grow inside of a, you know, a 50 to 70 day window, depending on the cultivar. 55, 60 days common. Um, so squash, mm. um, patty pans, uh, zucchini. Um, Butternut. No, yeah, spaghetti squash. Patchy, but this this time of year you're going to do the summer squashes if as long as the climate doesn't switch too much because i'm telling you it, it's harder and harder to decide when to start stuff with as much climate change as we're going through you know um but squash um okra super easy to grow um mm -hmm. cucumbers uh, on the cucumbers i like this cultivar called suyulong suyulong is an asian style cucumber it is delicious. This it's not big seeds. They grow very well. Um, you want to trellis them though, because you know you're going to get more yield, and they have a tendency to curl. Mm. They can get like you know two feet long, but they're delicious. Sue you long. Mm. Uh, um, uh, corn is not. I mean, if you have enough space, you can do corn. But if you just have a small area, corn's not going to do you really good. Mm -hmm. um, tomatoes. Um, Matt's wild cherry is an almost indestructible little cherry tomato that you can can raise and i guarantee you, if you plant mats wild cherry you'll have so many cherry tomatoes you'll be sick of them <laughs> but they are so delicious they're sweet they're a little tiny but they will grow it grew so well that for yeah they're like about the size of grapes but you it's an old heirloom variety but i guarantee you mats wild cherry you'll have all the tomatoes you need and it will self seed from year to year because right. we we had it growing in our chick we fed you know the chickens ate it and then it grew up in the chicken yard it grew up so much it took over you sure. know they were like 15 feet tall and still it's crazy wow, wow but they wow. sure were good so Matt's what about the brass what about lettuce? brassicas say again what about your brassicas okay i like um kales let's talk about kales um Rainbow Lacinato Kale. Rainbow Lacinato Kale. Mm. That is an excellent variety. It's delicious. It's my favorite kale to eat. And I like all of them, but Rainbow Lacinato is delicious. Very easy to grow. So is Red Russian Kale. You want a super easy Red Russian Kale. Hard to beat it. It will grow and it tastes good. That's like 45 days, right? That's like 45, 50 days and you're eating, man. I mean, you can eat it in salad greens before then, but it's it's really good. On the lettuce side, I like um, Jericho. I'll tell you why I like Jericho. Jericho is a, a romaine type. Romaine kosh, you know, that's a delicious lettuce. I grow it every year. Um, it can tolerate heat. Wow. And that's okay. one of the things that many lettuces can't. So it might get very hot here, but Jericho romaine lettuce will tolerate the heat and make, I mean, I've had like two foot heads of lettuce wow. that are just gorgeous, delicious. Wow. I like that one. Well, we're going to um, Oh, it's good. It, it's, it's, <laughs> and it's easy. Um, let's see what else we grow. Oh, you're a bunch of stuff here. I grew that, um, what was the name of that? Zucchini that we grew last year. Do you remember, dear? Uh, that was the gray. Uh, oh, tender, tender gray. Zucchini. Got the seeds from Southern Exposure. My goodness. <laughs> I, I was picking 75 pounds every three days. Wow. Yeah, 75 pounds every, and if you let it go, 
you know, because you know, we had more than we needed and we could sell, those suckers would get like two feet long. And another one, here's, I like heirloom stuff, so I'm not going to lead you wrong. Costato Romanesca. It's an ancient, well, it's an Italian heirloom, Costato Romanesca. It can get 18, 20 inches long and still be tender. Wow. That's super good. It's tender. You can scoop it out, bake it, fry it, dip it, whatever you want. It's good. Mm, 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 mm. Okra is super easy, but, you know, a lot of people don't like okra, but, hey, okra is good for you. Yeah, super you good. Know, I, didn't, I didn't like it as a child, but I, I love it now. There's a new book out about okra, too. Um, I saw it, uh, The Whole Okra. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. And it talks about how you can eat literally almost every part of the okra plant. It's except for, I think, like, except for the stalk, it's like the leaves, yeah, the flower. The seeds, yeah. yeah. You could probably use the stalks for, for biomass or fiber and use it like, you know, use a hemp stalk, you know? I see somebody says something about dandelion and chickweed. Uh huh. Uh, definitely. Oh, what can be grown near pine trees? Well, here's the problem with pines that's going to make it very acidic. So if you notice, if you've ever been through a pine forest, you don't see much growing around the base of pines. And that's the reason. So what grows in pines would be blueberries because they like acid. You'd have to open it up and make sure you got enough light in there. But blueberries could do good in that environment because they like acidic. So anything that likes acidic could grow there as long as you've got enough light. Mm -hmm. um, morning glory is something that, you know, they can be a nuisance. Uh, they're pretty to look at, but... You know, if you're doing much with a, a, a tiller or a tractor and stuff, that stuff can make a mess for you to have to clean it out of your tines. Uh, and what situation with soil on the land do you till? Aha, uh -huh. very good question. That's from KT. Um, many people are proponents of no-till. Um, Elaine Ingham is a proponent of no-till. I understand the concept behind it. And here's what I have to say. And I'm a very organic farmer, but I do have a tiller and a tractor. It's all about economy of scale and how hard you want to work your butt. And if you don't overtill, I find a light tilling to be a very helpful because when I first came here, it was hard. And if I hadn't tilled it, I wouldn't have it where it is now. So it really depends. You know, I mean, you can be all altruistic about it and say, I'll never till. Well, you may never eat this year <laughs> if, if you don't. It just depends on how, how much you want to eat and how much food you want. Right. You know, right. sometimes you just have to be super practical. Um, if it's mostly my wife and I, and one other person on the farm, if I didn't till, uh, um, we'd be out there till October trying to do it by hand and I would not be eating. So, but now that I've done it a few times, I can really just pull stuff back. It's not so hard, but I'm not going down a foot either. You know, I might be going down two inches so I can get a good stuff and then I will come back and mulch it. But I also use drip irrigation and biological pest controls and all of that. So I use a, a, let's talk about pest control. Fortunately, most of you are gonna do this on a scale where you don't have to really worry a whole lot. You know, you may be able to pick stuff off by hand once you learn to identify what your major pests are, but there is an organic product called Pyganic, and um, it is an Organic Material Review Institute approved, and I, I use Pyganic, and I use Neem, and those are the two things that we use. And I mix the two together and put them in a, in a sprayer. And that's all I ever use on my farm. And I've never had a need to do more. Are you getting that from Seven Springs Farm? I, I know that company. Um, I, yeah, that, that they're a good, just as good a source as any. But, you know, look on the internet. If you can get a better price, hey, you know, do what you got to do. But it, it's good stuff. Where did we buy it from? I, it wasn't from Seven Springs. Where was it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, new new country organics is where we got it from, but they're online. Just okay. you know, shop around, use your money wisely. Okay, you know. And I, I will, those, I will. Those two products work really well. I will contribute this and say, uh, you said it was uh, Pyganic. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, send me that link for that or a list of that okay. because uh, I'll buy. We'll yeah, we'll we'll buy in bulk. And then you know distribute to folks. Okay, my wife's gonna bring the bottle. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the comments now, so um, we can share that information. Um, yeah, we we bought a bunch of stuff, but that's um, what works, and it's it's really simple to mix it, and and you can eat the stuff. You know what I mean? But 
I'm not going to eat it as I spray it. That's for sure. Right. Um, it's P Y G A N I C. You see that bottle? So uh, Kenyatta's asking about seven dust. I, I um, no. diametaceous earth. I nope. I, Don't use seven. It's not organic approved and it's bad for your lungs. That's so that's this fine. is okay. I'm gonna put this on there. I don't know if you can see this. You probably won't be able to. Can uh, you see it? it? I can see it. Yeah. Organic. We got mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's made by a company called Do 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 Crop Protection. No, no. What's the name of that? Well, yeah, Pyganic is what you need. I'm gonna, I'm gonna type it up here too. Um, so, so what about? So, one of the things I want to add is that you know, but you know, the better your soil health, the less you're gonna have to worry about uh, diseases on your plants. You know, uh, totally. You know, the better, the yes. better your the better, more organic matter you're adding to your soil, the better the balance of your soil is, the less you'll have to worry about that. I mean, stuff, if you live in a city or anywhere, you're going to have to deal with anywhere. squirrels, you know, that, they, they're, unless you get yeah. a dog or, yeah. or yeah. a cat or something like that to, like, keep them away, you got... And, 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 yeah, you're going to have to do whatever it takes. A diatomaceous earth is good. Seven dust is not something I would ever use on, on my farm. It's not something that I would ever recommend. I know that people use it, but if you're going to be organic, you're not going to use seven. Um, it's just use your diet to make sure get an old, you know, those old flower hand. You know, anybody ever seen those old sifters where you just sift flour, you know, yeah. go to a, a cooking shop, get an old flour sifter, put your diet to make sure earth in it and shift, you know, especially for eggplants when you get those flea beetles, mm. you know, they're always going to come for eggplant. They're always going to show up. So we just religiously dust with the diatomaceous earth and um, takes care of them. You're going to get some holes in your leaves, but that's part of nature. You really don't want a garden with no insects. Right. That's not healthy either. Right. So it, it's, right. you want a normal, again, it's the balance. There's going to be some insects. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a bad thing. Some right. people say to me, well, I've got bugs. I'm like, well, you know, if you have a healthy environment, bugs belong there too. You're going to have some bugs. You know, you don't want to nuke everything. That's not what this is about. It's about seeking that balance. But let's go back to the soil because everything starts. Literally, everything starts in the good soil. Get that soil right. It might take you a couple of seasons to experiment with it, but get the soil right. And that's 70% of the work. And the rest of it, you know, once the seed comes up, all you're going to do is be a steward and make sure it gets the right moisture and the right sun and the right nutrients as a supplement to what's in the soil. But if the soil is really, really good, ask yourself, have you ever gone up Skyline Drive? Mm. It's full of plants. Mm. Who fertilizes it? <laughs> How does that happen? Who, Who waters it? Right. Who sprays it? How does it happen? That mm. nature can be that, that's back to Elaine Ingham's concept, which is really the natural concept of getting that bacterial balance right and then it takes care of itself and nature will replicate. It's only when you go into nature and try to take things out of their natural environment that you have problems with them. So our mission should be to try to replicate nature as closely as we possibly can and then to leave it alone. You know, part of, part of growing is being a, becoming a good observer. Sometimes we micromanage too much and that's when people overwater. Or, you know, or underwater or over medicate because they think, well, if a little phosphorus is good, then three times more is better. No, not, not the no, it's, no. It's a waste. You kill stuff. Right. Right. You know, so think about it. You got all those parks and stuff around there, but nature's done a good job for many years, but we're kind of giving it a run for the money and challenging it now because we've created an imbalance ourselves. You know, and the whole global environment that's uh, taking a toll. Tell me, uh, talk about the drip irrigation and water wise gardening. Okay, using drip irrigation automatically is going to save you about 60% of your water usage, which means it's also going to save on wherever your water source is. You know, I assume you're using um, garden hoses and city water, most of you, is that right? So you're going to attach to an existing water source. 
So you want to, you, what you want to do then is you want to put a pressure regulator in there um, just so you're not blowing, you know, too much pressure through your um, drip irrigation. But drip irrigation is a very useful tool. I use it. You use tape? You, you use tape or, or tube? I use tape. Mm. Now, people have used soaker hoses in the tubes. I find the tape to be more efficient. Um, but then, you know, I've had rows that were like 400 feet long. I don't do 400 feet anymore. I won't go more than 100 because I don't want to walk that far when I'm picking and harvesting. 100 feet is enough. 400 feet row, you feel like you're never going to get to the end of it. So I break it into 100 feet, 80 feet. But drip tape is really good. It's cost effective. Um, you can buy that with slits in it at 6 inches or 12 inches or 24 inches. You know, I would recommend the 6 inches. Um, spacing for most of your ordinary gardening and then you plant or transplant to the slit in the tape. So say you wanted to plant plants two feet apart, the slits are six inches apart, so every um, six, twelve inches, so you would go four slits and plant each plant and you would have the spacing that you need depending on the crop that you're growing. If you're growing squash, they're going to need three feet apart. And then you have the distance in your rows. So there's two, two dimensions to know. The space in a row mm -hmm. between each plant and the space between each row. They're not the same thing. <laughs> so if you're planting in a row, you might need two feet between each plant, say a squash plant. I would go three feet because they get huge. Mm -hmm. But you also need three feet between your rows so that you'll have space to walk in between and harvest. But you want that leaf canopy to, be, to form a shade to suppress, you know, weed and grass growth in between it, you should be mulching it anyway, but that way you have the overlap. So when you walk through, it's not like a jungle. You know, but you know, be, I also like to triangulate when I plant. So, you know, I, I plant what I call like the, the three diamonds. So I triangulate so that I'll have space to, to walk between the plants. And I also will increase my yield that way. Um, so Ariel has a question. Oh, no, hold on, back, let me go back. Anya had a question about sulfur, using sulfur in the garden. I know that people use it. I've seen people use it too, like my bio-nutrient gardening guys. Like yeah, they, yeah, and I've, you know, I personally haven't, so I can't, and you know, most of the time out here people will use it, um, well, they try to use it to keep snakes out, mm. um, but most of the snakes we have around here are actually helpful and not harmful, so I don't necessarily do that. Um, I have never used sulfur personally because I just haven't had a need to, but yes, people do use it, and it is useful. To amend the soil if you need it. Depends again on what you're going to grow. So you really need to know what pH you're looking for. 6.5 is, is very adequate for most things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I have to say about sulfur. When somebody asks what's a good sized garden, can we read okay, still? And the answer to that question, Ariel, is there is no one answer to that question because yeah. when you have enough to feed a family, that depends how many in your family, how 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 good of a workers are they? How much time do they have to work on that? You know, I mean, if you're going to feed four people, you can take uh, an area the size of a, um, like a normal dining room area. I'm saying normal in quotes, but um, say a, a 12 by 20 is a is a pretty good space to grow a number of things in. You know, I mean, it, it all depends on the economy of scale that you're after. How many people you want to feed and for how long? because you're going to have to have a different modalities to do that. Some may have to be under plastic or glass. Some are going to have to be, you know, out in the open ground. Some are going to have to be on trellises. And that's where you get down to the garden design factor. So what I do is, you know, you put the tall stuff in the back. You're going to plant so that you have a good southern exposure. So that means the north side of your garden is where you're going to have your tall stuff. And you're going to grow the smaller, shorter stuff in front of the tall so that they don't get shaded. Uh, by the sun. That'll give you maximal yield. Um, does straw conserve moisture? Yes, straw does good. Straw, and you know, straw is just like the second or third cutting of, of hay that gets coarse. That's really technically the difference between it. So the, and straw generally has less seed matter, 
as a result of that because the plant's already gone through the phase where it's put out the seed, the grass has already put out the seed and the, the straw is really the byproduct of, of haying. It's the coarse part that's left over when the plant gets so mature that it's too tough to sell for hay. Hmm. Yes, so the answer to that question is yes. Um, so, uh, I might, let me see what time, what are, what are we doing on time? How are we doing on time with you? I mean, where I'm, I'm, I'm at home. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little water. So let's talk a little. So so I'm I got I'm doing something different this time around, Baba. Uh, one of the things uh, I'm I'm recommending that they read Gaia's Garden. Okay. Uh, on permaculture. Permaculture is very cool. And uh, so I, maybe maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about permaculture and from your experience of what that's all about, um, so that people can. Um, be aware okay. of that of those techniques. So uh, here at Vanguard Ranch, we are we are beginning. We, we've used permaculture. We know the principles, but we haven't specifically set out to do that. But now we are. So and the reasons that we're doing that is that one, we're older; two, we're wiser; and three, we don't want to work as hard as we used to. So permaculture is when you establish permanent vegetative beds and fruit and trees is where you're going to build this whole ecosystem that provides, and I think that is the magnificent way to go. So say something like, let's pick one thing, let's pick asparagus. Okay. A lot of people like asparagus. That's a perfect crop that you can do in a permaculture bed. Set it up and 15 or 20 years from now, you could still have asparagus if you manage it well. Mm -hmm. So if behind the asparagus, if you put some grapes and behind the grapes, if you put some figs, now you've got fruit, and you've got asparagus. That's a good example of a permaculture setup. And now in the center of that, you're gonna grow your lettuce and your cucumbers and your tomatoes. And that's a perfectly good way to do it. And what you pick your scraps from those beds, you build these beds that basically become self replicating and maintaining. I've seen some magnificent gardens that are very inspiring to me because I believe that permaculture is the absolute best way to go. It really truly is. You don't have to plant in straight rows. You don't have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Right. You just really create an environment around you that is filled with food mm -hmm. year round. Mm -hmm. Take some work, take some study, but once you get it laid in, you're in a much better place than everybody is right now. Right. So yes to permaculture. That's something that I'm going to be incorporating more on our farm. Mm -hmm. And um, this because, you know, I'm 67 now. I'm not trying to do stuff again 40, 40 years over. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm all for the trees and the berry bushes and stuff like that, man. There you go. There you go. Um, we um, have taken some of these garden spaces and we planted, you know, uh, 30, it's like 30 plus fruit trees at McDonough. <sighs> you know, at McDonough Community Garden, it's probably like at least seven different varieties of fruit tree, um, grapes. Blue blackberries, you know, um, it's it's gumi berries there. There's doji berries, so we kind of created. It, it didn't start like that. It started out with the traditional raised beds, you know what I mean. But as time progressed, yeah. we started adding these different permanent fixtures. And I tell you no lie, there's nothing more amazing than going to the garden and there being yeah. pears on a yep. tree, you know, and peaches on a tree. Um, it's I agree. It is, you know, we've had more success with growing Asian pears here mm -hmm. in, um, in in Richmond, Virginia, than we have any other crop. I mean, well, figs, with the exception, I've seen mm -hmm. I've seen fig trees that were over thirty years old. That yep. were, I mean, you think this is like oak? How huge it was. <laughs> um, I've also seen. Uh, you know these uh these uh these uh these uh pear trees really produce, but the, the the other trees like the apples, you know the uh, peaches, uh, they just require a lot more attention uh, mm -hmm. and uh, fertilization in order to keep them uh, from catching diseases and uh and 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 to keep the pests at uh, at bay, but um. I'm trying to think of uh, other trees. We've, we've planted apricots, um, persimmons, um, which I I was surprised. Persimmons, yeah, they, they do good. They grow. Yeah, they grow. Persimmon they grow. Is, is an amazing tree. 
you know, when I first moved out here, you know, that wood is super expensive too, by the way. It takes a long time to get there, but man, that's some tough wood. Really? You have to cut persimmon, but wow. persimmon um, is yeah. very expensive. But um, figs do good, um, apricot peaches, um, pecan, walnut. Oh, yes, yes, takes a little bit of too. time, but if you got the space, they're good to, to do all of those things. Mm. But and the whole thing with the permaculture, though, set that up. And if you could set it up and get also incorporated like a beehive, and maybe for those of you who are into the, the, the livestock side of it, even some um, bantam chickens, you know, the little small ones, they don't tear up the ground so much. They'll mm -hmm. do insect control, They'll and they're going to fertilize as they grow, as they mm -hmm. walk around and root and scratch. Right. Um, they're very useful too, and then, you know, you can eat the eggs if you want. Mm -hmm. So, you, But that's the whole permaculture thing, is to set it up. So you basically are an observer and a steward, you know, once it's set up, you can relax. Mm -hmm. That there's a real wisdom in doing permaculture, everybody. Seriously, permaculture is the way to grow. Seriously, mm -hmm. that's. I mean, we are. You know, we're we, we, most of our st stuff here is going to be in our own, like our own private space. That for food security is going to be permaculture, high tunnel, and with some small rows in between for annual things that we want to grow: our lettuce, our peppers. Right. You know, tomatoes, cucumber, melons. Melons also, depending on, they need space though. Melons take, you know, a good, they, the vines run a good six, 10 feet, 12 feet, depending on the, what variety. So they're not the, the most space conscious thing to try to grow. Right. I've seen people try to grow them and, you know. Everybody wants uh, watermelons. I don't recommend melons in a small space. Everybody wants melons though. Everybody wants cantaloupes. Yeah, well, I might, I might help them out this year. I might do some, you know, but, <laughs> you know. It's just one of those things, man. I, you know, I had them before and they, mm -hmm. they were really good, but you, they need a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mm -hmm. have that irrigation and the dripping stuff or like carrying water, but for your own personal use, I mean, two vines is plenty, right. you know, right. and you save those seeds for, and you're, you're good to go year, year after year. A uh, question about uh, somebody posted this earlier and I, I think I skipped it or missed it, but where, where would you recommend getting the mushroom compost or, co or getting compost? If you're going to import it, um, there is a guy by the name of William Hale. He's an um, he used to be a president of the Virginia Association for Biological Farming, as was I years ago. And he's got a compost up here. He mm. makes good organic compost in Louisa County. Mm. Um, so his name is William Hale. I would contact William. I've okay. seen his product and it's good. Okay. Okay. But I mean, locally. You know, do you guys have any stables down there in Richmond, like people horseback riding stables? If you if you do, if you got a horseback riding stable, Colonial Downs, hold up, Colonial they'll Downs, probably right? give you they'll probably give you free manure. Somebody's got to muck that stuff out. Somebody's mm -hmm. probably jumped on it already. But uh, if you find a place like that that does um, horseback riding or stable, a livery stable. Right. See, the race, the race, they, the, 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 they're probably the happy just to give it to you if you go take a truck and a shovel. Mm, mm. And then you know you're halfway there. Mm, Let that stuff mm. age up. Throw you some red wigglers in it. Put you some straw, some compost, some grass clippings, and bingo. Mm. Let it percolate. Spray it with a little Neptune's harvest on it. I'll tell you what else is good, guys. Anybody, if you have beer or know people who make beer, and you can get that leftover um, grain. Oh wow! Good compost. So really? you got all those breweries. I used to go to a brewery in Charlottesville and get it like in 50 gallon drums. Mm. and uh, I made good compost for a couple of seasons so they went out of business oh, but you wow. got a lot of breweries and they got to get rid of that mash every time they brew so there's like a daily thing right say it again as a, that's like a daily thing right yeah whenever they brew yeah a couple of days but they're gonna you know they they somebody's probably taking it back to their farm already but if you know somebody just ask them and yeah. you know they usually give it to you it's a good compost start now, for so the mushrooms, you know, I only know this one mushroom farmer close to me, but, you know, that would be good. I, I, um, I'm fortunate that I can get some if I need it, but I've got enough goat manure and stuff on the farm where I, I just don't have to add much to my stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things, some other questions that I, I know to ask. Um, we'll probably we think of something so in a few minutes. <laughs> we talk, we, <laughs> look, we talk about soil food web. We talked mm -hmm. about cover cropping. We talked about compost and composting. Uh, we Gosh. talked about plant spacing, water conservation. 
Um, we talked about pest management a bit. Um, uh, let's let's talk about pollinators. 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 Bees. Okay, y'all. Even you're in an urban environment, but guess what? You can raise bees. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things, you know. Sure, you you need the pollinators. It's good for the planet. Mm -hmm. But the honey's also good for your health. Right. And you can make mead out of it. Mead. If you want a little fermented flavor. And mm. uh, honey wine is going to be a big thing. Mm, 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 mm. You know, there are a few meaderies. That's what they're called, meaderies, um, popping up in the state. Um, but, you know, if you've got a rooftop or a backyard, you might consider beehives. I'll show you. Look. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh-huh. We, we got, our, we got yeah. a beehive last um, there you go. Last year, we need to get some more bees because our bees died. Uh-huh. Our bees died over That's right. I mean, over the and My wife just had, tell them, make sure that I mention um, cayenne pepper and, and garlic as a homemade spray for insects because that also does work, cayenne peppers. If you want to grow peppers, grow them. You know, you don't just grow them because you, some people say they don't like hot peppers. I happen to like hot peppers, but they make great rabbit repellents. To keep the cats out from digging up and putting their, you know, cat doo-doo in your garden, which you don't want, um, and your dogs and so forth, put a pepper spray around it. But every time it rains, you're going to have to go back out and refresh because, you know, it it's, it's washed away. What kind of peppers have you? Uh, we we uh, what kind of peppers have you used that uh, to cut to keep those? Uh, I've used habanero because I had a surplus of them. <laughs> you know. Uh, habanero peppers grew great. Mm, um, mm. We had too many. When I say too many, I mean, I couldn't sell them all. I couldn't eat them all. So, um, you know, rabbits were a problem. And uh, I didn't, unless you're going to stay up all night, rabbits are going to come around and visit. Now, maybe not so much in the city, but they do out here. So, yeah, we used the pepper spray and they sprayed it around the base of the stuff. And rabbits take a sniff of that and turn and run the other way. Work. Worked good. So we grew um, habanero peppers. I grew African fish peppers. I grew Hungarian black peppers. And, um, oh, God, what was that other one I tried? It was a, like a Carolina Reaper, but I ate that one. I just wanted to try it and see how hot it was. It's too damn hot. It's, it's too damn hot. No sense, no <laughs> sense to eat something that hot. That's just crazy. You got to really hate somebody to feed them that one. Makes no sense. <laughs> No sense. I got hey, so one of my, my boy John, he loves all this hot stuff. So uh -huh. I don't know, like uh, we grew ghost peppers. Okay. Last year. And yeah. I tell you, I put a ghost pepper in my pocket. Mm -mm. And, um put my hand in my pocket, wipe my forehead. And you were crying, weren't you? Yep. Man, yep. I was like, well, what you. in the world? It just I, I felt the heat start to radiate all over oh, my yeah. forehead. It was the worst feeling I ever had in my life. It was makes it, no sense. Yeah, I don't know why people do that. It's torture. I mean, you know, it, yeah. I, you you got to pick those peppers with with um, plastic gloves on. Yeah, right. Because right. just uh, the oil will get into your skin, and if you you know if you you know pick your nose, heaven forbid, you know you you'll never forget that feeling. Don't scratch your eyes or go to the bathroom or touch any of your private spots because you'll be oh. on fire. Oh my god, <laughs> you'll be on fire. Um, so, so, so one uh, of the things that I want to add, though, in, in, in relationship to the time that we all find ourselves in now with this coronavirus and, you know, where we're thinking about how fragile our existence is on this planet, because really what separates the Earth from these other planets is topsoil. We have topsoil on this planet, which allows us to grow things. Mm. If it wasn't for the topsoil, Earth would be barren. So the soil is the key. So everything you can do to build good, healthy soil, you're doing the right thing at the right time. But if you really want to have food security, this is the time to think about it. If you're depending on somebody to feed you, you're not in a very good place. I think we're all realizing that now. Yeah. But moving forward, do you want, do you, is the solution just for this to go away and not to change your situation? No. The solution is to change your situation. See, this is the wake-up call, and the creator has a master plan. Mm -hmm. I think some of us are going to get it. Some of us aren't. And those who are dependent on the stores to be there, 
and the food supply chains to be there, I think this is the wake up call because all that stuff is falling apart right now. I feel like you know? I feel like the lesson. I feel like one of the lessons from uh, nature, you know, is that nature collaborates, right? Absolutely. Nature, nature throughout nature, we see systems where different creatures, life forms, are interdependent of one another and they create realities for themselves where things balance out or that everyone is taken care of and you got everything that they need and i feel like if we could start to think about the ways that we can emulate nature in that way uh to support you know our whether it's food security housing you know clothing shelter all these different all these different things that you know at the at the base we all need food clothing and shelter right you know so finding ways that we can collaborate to to meet the need of 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 the whole versus just i'm focused on just me as an individual yes then we can create yes. better realities for each other mm -hmm. you know and yeah and and also learn how to build as much as you can because whatever space you have if you got a, a piece a piece of ground that's like 10 by 10 you might want to think about um putting together a frame and covering it so that you can have a grow space that will extend your growing season into the fall and into the winter it doesn't have to be super big but you know if you want to have food through the winter you can do that in a space that you can either heat efficiently or maybe even not have to eat depending on to heat rather depending on how much space you have yeah um so uh what we, we're we're at 838 uh tell people to, pe right. tell, to let folks know how they can get in contact with you sure uh, sure uh, um, so that they can stay synced up with the work that you're sure. doing yeah uh, because you, that you, didn't do, you didn't really do a good introduction about all the things that you're involved in and i probably <laughs> just kind of touched on it a little well, bit I, I, I do a lot. I don't like to talk a whole lot about it anymore, but I'll tell you, I, I am a person who has committed um, the rest of my life to living um, a self-sufficient lifestyle. Um, so a little bit about that is I intentionally left this. I haven't lived in a city since 1977 anywhere. So I have no visible neighbors where I am and I like it like that. Uh, we've been practicing social distancing for 40 years <laughs> and uh, it works um, I, I do a lot of work i've learned a lot of skills you know I, I can build a house run the electrical wire do the plumbing fix a tractor do fencing raise livestock show livestock uh, past president of the virginia association for biological farming served on secretary of vilsack's minority farm advisory council Virginia State University College of Agriculture, a um, bunch of other committees and stuff I'm on, currently sitting on the Community Ownership, Empowerment, and Prosperity team, part of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. Uh, just came back from being a keynote speaker um, a couple of weeks ago at Oregon State University, small farm conference. Met with a group of people up in um, Portland for the Black Food Sovereignty Conference where I was a featured speaker there. You know, very committed to agriculture as um, an act of liberation. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a society, we need to liberate ourselves from dependency because dependency is the curse that keeps us all enslaved. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people everywhere knew how to build houses, how to grow food. They did not need 401ks. They did not need um, bitcoins. They did not need any of that stuff. And I think that we've gotten to the point where we think we're so smart. We're rushing ahead too fast and look at the situation we're in now because most of the population of this country is confined to the Eastern shore and the Western shore. Mm. Those are the most highly populated areas and therefore the most vulnerable mm. because the populations there cannot fend for themselves and support their own daily needs and habits. Mm. So I think the indigenous people had it right. And mm. maybe everything since the industrial revolution has been going backwards and not forward mm -hmm. and if, if 5g is good does that mean 10g is better because what how far do you want to go and how fast are you going to try to get there mm -hmm. 
Maybe we're already there and we need to slow it down and turn it around. So, but my address is uh, vanguardranch at gmail.com. Um, we have a Facebook group and all that stuff, Vanguard Ranch uh, Meat Goats. And um, Lord, what's the other one there, dear? Um, Crossroads. Crossroads. Well, well www.vanguardranchnaturalgourmet. If you just put that in, stuff will pop up. Mm -hmm. I got lots of videos out there on the YouTubes, um, onto my Renard Turner channel. You can see that too. Sweet. And just hit me up with any questions. I'm always here to help anybody out. But seriously, think long term about security. <clears throat> think long term about dependency. And if you don't know where you're going to be five years from now, your plan ain't working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hit up some of these groups online. There's a lot of people out there that are doing homesteading and prepping. There's a lot of urban preppers. They got groups in Richmond. Some of them don't want you to know they're there. Right. But hit them up and find them. Yeah. I found out some interesting things. You know, when I found I did a search, they thought I didn't know Vanguard was this white supremacist organization in West Virginia. <laughs> but they hit me up. <laughs> and invited, invited me to some stuff. And I was wow. like, oh, snap. I got an inside lock. I said, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna roll up with a few of my homies, but you know, I said, nah, I don't want to do that. That's West Virginia, man. Oh my God, that's <laughs> insane to me. That's crazy. Yeah, but they had a whole booklet and everything out. Yeah, and they're serious. You know, matter of fact, one of the things they said was that when they was buying bullets, black folks were buying booze. Wow. That's one of the statements. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think they was investing in the liquor stores. That's crazy. It is crazy. It's deep. Survival ain't no ain't no joke. And it's also true that only the strong survive. Right, right, right. <laughs> and dependency is a perpetual perpetual state of weakness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Our society has to come to that. <clears throat> so just hit me up. It's been fun. I think yeah. I'm gonna eat. I Thank you. This has been dope. Some greens here. The greens are the greens are calling me. It's yes, man. Good. Thank you, man. I appreciate you for uh, yes, taking time out this evening in to rock with us. This has been really All good. Right. Um, All right. We'll be seeing each other. Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll, I'll, I'll some special stuff this year. Also, here's another tip. You guys look this thing up. Find you some um, oh purple turmeric. Purple turmeric. Yeah. Why? Anthocyanin content is higher. The higher the anthocyanin, the better the antioxidant mm. factors are. Mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm ordering me some, like, probably uh, no later than tomorrow. Word, word. Okay. That's so going to be gonna, my um, permaculture, bed. I'm going to have a permaculture, serious root permaculture. So that, so you could grow the two purple turmeric outside the high tunnel? You Well, it'll, yeah, you can grow it and save the roots, but just going to be like a ginger. You're going to, in the wintertime, you got to dig it up. You got to dig it up. Like, you know, you just replant it. Unless you're going to make a permanent covered area. Yeah, right. You know, you can make like a mini high tunnel. You right, know, you right, can do that right. out of PVC and some rebar and make you a mini high tunnel and, you know, rig it up so you give enough space to grow. And then just uh, when the weather's warm, take the cover off. And when the weather cools down, put the cover on. But in the winter, dig it up or cover it even, cover it deep enough and let it come back. So, I'm going to try it that way. So check this out. I talked to the dude, uh, Michael Riley uh, yeah, from, yeah. from Soil Food, uh, the, the mm -hmm. Soil Loans, whatever. Yeah, uh, he's a good guy. Your capital. And he yeah. was like, if you get an equip grant, if you get synced up with the equip, that he would front the money for you to get a high tunnel, for folks to get their high tunnel. Well, I can tell you this from personal experience. Michael Riley's been here at my house. Mm. I got a slow money loan from them, zero mm. interest when they first came out. Myself and Mark Jones from Surrando Farms are the first two people who got them. Wow. He's good people. Wow. Good deal. Good deal. He's real good people. Word. He's the person you can trust. Word. So we're gonna, he's we're gonna he's try to committed do some work to him. building a local food shed. So, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how we can get some um, high tunnels in um, in somebody's nondescript in the cut. Yeah, there's, you know, there's find somebody. There's somebody up here in Gordonsville. I saw this thing on a Craigslist. He was making the the, the hoops, hmm. and I'm like, darn, because all you need is the hoops. 
And if you got somebody with some skills, make your own. So yeah, I got a. I, so we got a. Um, I went to Farmer's Friend. They had the high tunnel mm-hmm. benders. You get the um, fence yeah, post, the benders. fence post, and then you just bend it on the fence. Yeah, post. yeah. I have the I have the bender, and I have the um, the ground. The, the pounder. Ground yeah, driver. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a so lot we, of work. I've done that once. I'm not gonna do it twice. Hard work. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> yeah, very much hard work. Yeah, you talking. Let's see. We, I don't know how many corners we we drove in. Plenty. Myself and Rossi and I think two other guys. But we, I don't, I don't want to do it again. Yeah. That's how much fun it was. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, tell you the truth, I would I would build it out of um, you know untreated wood with some screws and bolt that sucker together, right, and, right. and 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 put some anchors in the ground and put some uh, turnbuckles on it. And tighten that sucker down and skin it with plastic or even that phylon stuff because it's i think all my new stuff is going to be like with phylon because i don't have to worry about the wind ripping it and okay. it's more permanent okay Word. and you know it comes in sheets but you know it everything doesn't have to be curved i mean you can use right angles right you can right. you know do a, a peaked roof right. or even better you want want to consider um the um wallapini which is the in-ground type of growth thing I uh, see I that. I've seen that. I've seen that. I've seen that. Somebody man, all you need then is get a get a dozer operator, somebody to excavate. You go back in with the team and you frame it up with regular lumber. And then you put the phylon sheets on the front and build you a knee wall. I can draw it up. I mean, that's probably what I'm going to do next on my farm because once I do that, I don't have to worry about the wind mm. and I can titrate the temperatures myself by putting solar vents or whatever. Easy to do. Mm. You learn a lot. Word. Somebody asked about bamboo can split and grow. Yeah, bamboo is good too. And it's, you know, you can find it growing and people want to get rid of it. You know, and you can, that's a cheap way to grow. Get some bamboo or even PVC pipe and some, make you a small place. You get the little short rebar from Lowe's or Home Depot, put them in the ground, curve that plastic piping over it, get you some of that plastic cement, make mm-hmm. your tees, make your frame cover it with plastic, it'll last you a gross season or two. Yeah. And that's a manageable size. Yeah. 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 Lots of ideas. Okay. You're on the right path, guys, but take your food seriously. If you don't have some dry goods, get you some. Mm. Black beans and rice. Mm. Make it keep you nice. <laughs> <laughs> it beats all right, Baba. So all right, well, I'm gone. So listen, so all check right. this out. So all my folks that's on the call, y'all, this has been amazing. Um, I'm so excited that y'all chimed in today. Uh, whoever's still on the call, y'all are real MVPs. <laughs> um, what I was going to say, look, so Saturday we were supposed to get with um, Bruno Welsh with Compost RVA. Um, so that's my homie. Uh, I've been working with Bruno for years, uh, and he was going to do the hands-on, you know, with the composting, show people how to build their own compost 